Hello everyone. So I am delighted to be joined here today by Alexia and Rachel, who are coordinators for the People's Health Alliance New Zealand. The People's Health Alliance is creating an, an alternative decentralized people-led integrative healthcare model via hubs that empower and support people to take back control of their own health. Alexia is an Alexander Technique teacher of 24 years, which is a therapy based on the idea of poor posture, gives, us, gives rise to a range of health problems. She's also a mother of two, living on a small farm with a passion for natural medicine, traditional healing practices, and spiritual inner standing. Rachel is originally from England and moved to New Zealand in 2008. She's a photographer, creative, an NLP master practitioner and a mother of two who struggled with a challenged immune system for over 30 years. So we might jump into that a little bit. Alexia and Rachel have joined me today to talk about the amazing work the People's Health Alliance New Zealand are doing on the ground, particularly after the recent cyclone flooding disasters in parts of New Zealand. So thank you, first of all, Alexia and Rachel for joining us here today. It's good to be here. Thanks for asking us. And I'm very happy to be here. Rebecca. The first question that I ask everybody when I do one of these interviews, because I just think it's really inspiring for people to hear stories of ordinary people doing amazing things, is um, I don't know who'd like to start first, Alexia or Rachel, but if you just wouldn't mind sharing just a little bit of your story of, you know, um, when you came to realize that the world is not the way that we've been told it is and how that led you to start to, to come to creating uh, the People's Health Alliance New Zealand. You go, Alexia. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, wow. The People's Health Alliance um, came into my, my vision through um, Pam Gregory, um, astrologer, through a wonderful video that really got the word out internationally. Um, I've been yeah, on a natural health, um, spiritual path for a long time. Um, and, yeah, and luckily, born into a family that was quite actually um, awoke, awake, skeptic of um, government, government um, medical processes, things like that. So we had it in our, I was in the milieu all the time as <laughs> growing up. So obviously there's layers of... Um, of, of you know realizing all oh, what's going on and what on earth's happening and uh, the last three years has been a um absolutely <laughs> mind-blowing the extent of it but um yeah it's been a very gradual process for me and just um yeah clues all the way along growing up and um I'm a, an original sort of <laughs> skeptic um and questioner critical thinker so yeah I but blown away by the interview with Catherine McBean. I think we're all inspired by her and her um, team that have um, launched this amazing vision. Um, yes, I was just immediately inspired and thought, well, I can do this. Um, yeah, as you say, just an ordinary person, but it's the community. I'm part of a community. So yeah, I qualified to um, step up and um, launch this here in New Zealand. Fantastic. And quickly, quickly was, found Rachel. <laughs> yeah, maybe first, Rachel, would you like to share your a little bit of your story of how you came to uh, collaborate with Alexia? Um, well, it's so interesting that I had no idea that uh, how corrupt the world was until I started um, researching frantically the ingredients of this jab that was to be rolled out because. Um, my son reacted to the first MMR, so I knew it was a no-go for him. Um, and it wasn't until this started rolling out that my mum joined the dots and realised that um, the convulsions that I had as a baby and me dying and being resuscitated could actually have been a, a vaccine reaction. So, um, And she's a nurse. So it's been an interesting few years Um you know, you start searching and you you wonder why you can't find the information. Why isn't it there? How can I not access it? And then you start going down rabbit holes. And then it was, okay, the three months of, of, of realizing the extent of what was going on. Um, 
And then as I grew up, just always thinking, okay, it's, it, there's got to be another way. And then I come across, um, oh, it was before they actually launched, I come across um, an interview with a guy who was doing a talk and he he jumped the gun a wee bit and um, decided to set up a hub um, and was talking about the PHA. And I was like, this this is it. This is this is what I've been waiting for. This is the right model. And then when I saw the um, interview uh, with Catherine McBean and Pam Gregory, I was frantically messaging, trying to get hold of someone and um, and then was put in touch with Alexia, who had um, also done the same. So then we touched base and that was it. We just kind of hit the ground running. Um, you know, no, no skills of running um, something like this, but we thought it's it's got to happen and people will come and it will build and you know we'll yeah we'll just we'll just make it work <laughs> so before we jump into um when the new uh, the, the pha new zealand started and and how that kind of then moved forward um you also mentioned on the website about um the um, your your challenged immune system for over 30 years um was that linked, do you feel, to uh, the jab that you mentioned, or is that has that been part of the story that's um, kind of led you to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a number of things, so I'll just skim over it really quickly. So I had convulsions as a baby, and my mum was a newly qualified nurse, um, so fully, um, fully in love with a system that she just trained in and didn't think that there would be any reason for it to be in the vaccines that cause the convulsions. So she never questioned it at the time. Um, then I, I had like oh, my immune system as a child, I got everything, I was always sick. And then I had, when I was 13, I had it at the rubella. Um, and then two weeks later, it was in hospital covered in blisters, um, uh, blisters in my mouth and my eyes. I had to be fed on a tube, I had a catheter fitted. Then I started getting these big blisters of my arms and my legs. They didn't know what was happening. Um, I was photographed, um, but this is, I think that was what we were seeing with monkeypox. I don't know, it was just a reaction. Um, from then, again, my immune system weakened and I just had to be really careful. And still not connecting the dots with vaccines. When I went traveling to Australia, um, my GP told me that I needed a shot to go um, to go with just in case. And then three months later had ME, chronic fatigue. Um, and then by sheer luck, just happened to walk into a doctor's surgery where the GP um, was head of environmental and nutritional medicine um, for Australia. And she was in her seventies then, and she just, she was amazing. And this was the light bulb moment. She said, okay, I'm gonna recommend vitamin C, intravenous vitamin C, um, uh, a drip um, once a week for 10 weeks. I want you to eat only organic food. And I want you to search for mobile phone towers in the area and move away from any mobile phone towers. And there's a mobile phone tower on the building that we were renting and the base station was underneath, underneath the flat. Um, so we moved within two weeks and my immune system started to improve. Um, it took about six months before the deep fatigue um, Pass, but that was that was the wake up call to me. Okay, there's these ways are effective. Um, this vitamin C intravenous vitamin C was amazing. I had acupuncture. I had to have massage every week just to um, get rid of the lactic acid that was building up in my body. Um, and then nutrition. It, that was that was the wake up call. Yeah. And after those six months, was that then completely? cleared I mean was that no it was six months before I would um I would stop falling asleep in random places um where I could concentrate and remember what I'd gone into the kitchen for because it affects um chronic fatigue and ME doesn't just make you tired it actually well my experience of it was I couldn't think straight some days were really foggy um I would just suddenly need to, to sleep. I would literally just fall asleep and need to go and lie down. And um, I couldn't walk further than hundred meters. It was, it was awful. Um, but after six months, I was functioning 
um, for longer parts of the day, I could go back to work um, and had a really supportive um, uh, uh, boss at the time. Um, but I had to keep maintaining um, a really good diet, really good sleeping habits, couldn't push myself, had to be really careful. Um, and even now, I still need to be careful, but it's like, at least I have a life. I can do anything. I can, you know, um, it, it slipped back occasionally, but I'd say it took about two years after that six months before I didn't have to think about it. You know, the, the, the good eating habits were there. Um, the yoga, the, the meditation, the exercise, and it was all there. It was kind of inbuilt. Um, yeah, yeah, but it oh. yeah, it's it's also you know such a um, an inspiring example of kind of how important it is for us to you know to take care of ourselves and uh, to you know um, uh, reclaim our health, which is a lot to do with what you know the People's Health Alliance is about. Not to put, not to 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 give that power to somebody else, but to reclaim it ourselves. Yeah, we're so used to outsourcing, outsourcing our own um, health and our own um, systems. When it's mm. you know it's our responsibility. It's taking back the ownership of it. Yeah, so, and I was looking that day to, to, to walk into a surgery where the GP just happened to be the head of environmental nutritional medicine. It could have been so different, you know. Absolutely, yeah. It's um, kind of, what is it, roulette? You just, you don't know who you're going to get when you <laughs> go tonight. into that room. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, now might be a nice time for uh, maybe Alexia to explain a little bit about what uh what is the people's health alliance what are these health hubs what are you actually doing um as as you said um earlier we're we're a grassroots organization we're people led um we have the catch cry for the people by the people which connects us with everybody um and it's really just a basic idea to establish um, a network um, and a sort of a, a catch for the failing health systems that are, as, as in England and the UK, it is here too. Um, Australia, New Zealand, all suffering, um, you know, badly understaffed, low uh, resourced health system. So it was a, an idea to have a, um, a system that was a backup that was, um, you know, people can take back their their choice, have free choice also, not be dictated to of what they want to go and see. So we just um, gather the practitioners, the healers in the community, people who want to be involved in building a, a physical hub um, and just sharing in a, in a health and well-being space. We establish hubs in every locality um, as much as we can we're inspiring the idea to sort of snowball and um, the aim is a, a hub in every town so we're it, it is um, catching fire because it's a it's an idea that people want they want their own mm -hmm. um, back to a, a sort of a, a village clinic a, vin a village style of community health um, where they know they know who they can go to people can recommend um, much more easily and yeah with the loss of trust in the health system um, we're re-establishing trust so that's important and what, the when did you like, found when did you start the people's health alliance in new zealand it was in july we or yeah early july of uh last year it's only it seems like much longer time but it's actually only just coming up to a year so um yeah we're very it's just been amazing um yeah the spark it was like wildfire really um mm. and then we've been busy ever since um yeah gathering our tribe so um it, it's going really well in new zealand and how mm. many hubs do you have at the moment in new zealand around new zealand we have just over 20 and they're all different stages. So a lot are, are like a virtual space. It's all sort of basically run through Telegram. Um, we have our own website now, um, but there's, 
yeah, physical hubs building, there's um, groups who are, are using rented spaces or um, uh, just using like public halls and community halls um, to gather once a week or, and just lately with the need of, um, with the cyclone and the damage that, um, you know, went through our country, we've had pop-up hubs. Um, so it's, it's growing as the need arises. Mm. So, sorry, this is the first time I've interviewed two people at once. So um, <laughs> I'll jump over to Rachel for a moment. Um, so what does it look like if you go to a physical hub? So could it be, you know, is it like an office? Is it a town hall? Is it, uh, what does it look like? And then also what type of practitioners could you, could you expect to find in a hub? Um, well, let me, uh, so I'll talk about um, yesterday's hub, which was a pop-up hub, and then I can describe it fully. So we've, we've, um, we've rented this, this beautiful uh, wooden hall um, and we've, so because it's a pop-up hub and because the practitioners are do donating their time in this particular pop-up hub, because we are catering for those who have lost their houses, they're in severe trauma, um, they're going through a lot and just really struggling because there's a lack of support. Um, so most, most hubs won't be um, practitioners donating their time, but the pop-up hubs are. But it was beautiful. We had, um, there was some wonderful gardens. A couple of counsellors were working in the gardens that found quiet spots and it was a beautiful sunny day. So they'd found quiet spots and were working one-on-one uh, -on -one with practitioners in the garden. We had um, four massage beds set up, uh, set up within the hall um, with a cranial osteopath, uh, a Reiki healer, um, an energy healer. And there's another lady that works with, again, an energy healing, but they were very different. So you had Reiki and you, you had three different kinds of energy healing, all amazing. Um, there were also the, like some women donated their time just to kind of make drinks and serve drinks to people and welcome them and chat when they're waiting to see um, practitioners. So it's about the community holding the space um, and really getting behind the hub. There is another couple of hubs that have opened and um, the one in Bay of Plenty is uh, a, a, somebody kindly donated uh, four rooms in the house. So he's got a large house. Uh, so he donated the downstairs for the PHA to use, um, the PHA hub in that area. So they have four rooms. So they work at like a really low cost to rent those rooms. So practitioners rent the rooms whenever they need them, which means that they can supply treatments to the community uh, at a lower cost so it becomes more affordable so for the community it means that they can look after themselves they don't have to you know worry and stress about paying for things when they need it um, they can go in and have treatments and if anyone in the community is struggling we encourage social pot social fund pot so um, if the community gets behind the hub and we fundraise that goes into a pot so if somebody comes in and really needs treatment and just struggling you can use the funds from the pot to pay for the to pay the practitioner, so the practitioner is not out of pocket, and the the, um, the the client gets their treatment. And with this um, system in England, uh, eighty five percent of people who use that uh, usually either come back and uh, repay the money that they owe, or they send paying clients to the hub because it's a great um, word of mouth. They feel held, uh, they feel supported. Um, and again, a variety of practitioners. In, and it depends who's in the community. Um, in the, there's another hub close to me, and it's again, it's um, it's just a virtual hub at the moment because they're searching for a space. And there's a nurse, so the nurse has been um, dressing wounds and looking after people who can't get back into the hospital for follow up appointments. Um, and that's that's vital because a lot of people are quite fearful. They're fearful and they're anxious that they have to wait so long for an appointment. So to have a nurse based in a hub who can look after things like that is, is brilliant. So for those people that uh, are, are watching this interview now and aren't aware of, you know, when you say the cyclones that went through New Zealand. So what, what was the devastation? What was it like? What's actually happened in New Zealand? Um, so I can talk, so I went down to Hawke's Bay um, 
and I've seen the devastation in on the west coast of Auckland. So Hawke's Bay is about four or five hours, five hours away from Auckland. And they had floods like they'd never seen before. So we call it an adverse weather event. Um, the, the damage was incredible. Um, the destruction roads were closed. You, you, usually it takes five hours, but the, the, all the main roads were closed. They managed to get one road open. So when I went down to take supplies and try and kind of connect people with groups that were setting up, because a lot of people were cut off, it took, um, I think it was 11 hours to get there. We had to go um, quite a long way around. Um, it meant there was a lot of food trucks couldn't get through. Um, some supplies had to be helicoptered in. Um, the government response wasn't um, as good and as quick as it could have been. Um, so there was a lot of, like even now, I mean, crikey, uh, how many weeks are we on now? Six weeks, seven weeks? Maybe seven, seven weeks. weeks. Seven weeks. Oh my gosh, gosh. We Eight weeks. So Kevin, bless him, on the call is is down in Hawks. Seven weeks down in Hawks Bay. Um, there are still people who are cut off. Um, there there are people who can't live in their homes. Their, their homes are completely um, being gutted because of the amount of water and mud and silt that come through their properties. Um, they are psychologically worn down. Um, we have we, we've set up a pop up hub in Hawke's Bay and it's really to, you know, we're starting to get people through, but it's people knowing that it's there is offering that psychologically psychological support um, that they know that other people around the country are trying to set up systems for them when, when the local authorities or the government aren't. So it's holding, it's holding space for a lot of people. They're still in that kind of adrenaline fueled mode. Like some people are coming in, but some are just still, um, just still in the thick of it, still clean and still trying to um, find some form of normality. Um, it's just extraordinary, really. That the, there was houses, there was so much water that it went from ground level to roof level in about. 10 minutes 15 minutes we've got stories of people waking up with um with noise and wondering what the noise was go to get out of bed feel water on their feet by the time they get to the front door to see what's going on it's up to their knees they literally grab their phone and their wallet they open the door they're realizing it's up to their hips they climb on to the roof uh the carport roof and it was up to the house to the top of the house and they climb on the house roof and then they're clinging onto a chimney for eight hours. That's how fast it come through. Um, and one of the reasons, yeah, there's just so much trauma and um, and just anger, actually. There's a lot of um, anger at um, the fact that there was no warning about this immense amount of rain. There were um, systems that, that didn't activate the old um, civil defence sirens, um, weren't, weren't um, were disabled. People were completely taken by surprise and then left on roofs for eight hours. Um, I'm just reading even today that um, a police operation carried on at the same time, which was um, searching for illegal cannabis and was spraying the cannabis plantations and they didn't divert the helicopters to rescue people. So all this information is sort of slowly trickling out. There's a lot of unanswered questions. So. Yeah, it's a very, very um, traumatised area. And, and the same in near Auckland, in West Auckland, where, where Rachel is. Um, mm. Just just so much damage and not enough um, official help. It's, it's like mm. it's, um, it's just not forthcoming. So, yeah, there's and the, help. Needs. And the pop-up hub, just to explain, so the help that they have got through to the, particularly the West Coast communities near me, um, they've got, the, they've sent counsellors in, but the counsellors are just, um, they're help, they're trying to help, but people are still in that trauma stage and you just can't open up because they're still in the thick of it. So they're just um, uh, writing prescriptions for, for Valium and there's nothing else. Um, so the, you know, organising the pop-up hub and having healing and cranial, oste cranial osteopathy, you know, those modalities actually help the body to, you know, not hold on to the trauma. 
Um, so that's been key. And the amount of we've only been gone for three, one day a week. And this is the third, the third session was yesterday. The amount of people who are writing notes and popping them in uh, the feedback box just saying, oh my goodness me, you have no idea how this is holding me and my family together because we know that a group of people who care have got together and and have set this up out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, it's it's yeah, it's extraordinary. I mean, some that their houses are gone, their houses are flattened. Um, there's cracks in roads, the roads have been washed away. Um, there's this huge amount of houses have been red stickered. Now that in New Zealand means that you can't go back in. You're not allowed back in um, until council come and check it, but they're saying it's going to take years to get the roads back to normal. Um, so the, the locals have taken it upon themselves to fix the roads themselves. Um, you know, the men haven't gone back to work. They've just got diggers in and are fixing the place up. Yeah, it's so important what you said, you know, like this release of this trauma. So when it gets, you know, where it is, to, is to get it out. Um, I do hypnotherapy and whatever modality, just a way to release that rather than, as you say, Valium, take a pill, uh, cover it up as best as possible. Um, Alexia, what has the, the, the mainstream coverage has the, of this been like? Has there been any criticism of the government's response? There has been a lot of criticism. Um, the the sort of the old way of um, people want to help in New Zealand. It's um, the the community really, you know, was shocked, and the wider community, they you know just leaped to the to the aid of people. But the the normal channels were to donate through Red Cross and organisations like that. And um, now we're finding none of the money is, is being filtered through. It's, or it's very hard to find out where, where it is going. The councils, the government um, uh, yeah, official channels are just not um, helping in the actual need that we see just through social media and things like that. We've had um, just people-led groups, many people-led groups, um, just going down to say, okay, we're going to do it ourselves. So it's Mm. Um, it's just become so evident that because there's people on the ground doing it, that no, no other formal help, the army was deployed, but we're not seen mm. with shovels and spades help digging silt. Um, they were just at, at the, um, the wharves. There's just so many un unanswered questions, and I think that's leading to yeah this anger, and um, it's, it's actually building. There's me meetings still going on to, to try and get answers of why this water, because it, it didn't seem like normal flooding. Um, it seemed like um, stop banks were actually um, um, burst Long. or dams burst and walls of water hit people, not, not just normal rainfall um, flooding, flood rising. So there's many unanswered questions. So yeah, mm. it's, it's just a very traumatic time for people everywhere but always the silver lining is that communities do pull together and um, it's just been inspiring to see we were lucky because with the PHA we had already set up a framework of a hub in, in Hawke's Bay and also in West Auckland and we quickly had um, practitioners and people who were just you know amping to, um, to go and help together so we had the communications um, set and it was it made a very quick response for us to channel donations to the right people to who to the actual families that needed it. Mm. So, yeah. That was going to be my next question, actually. So <clears throat> from the moment that this happened, what was that kind of you know galvanizing, getting organized? What was that like for 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 you, Rachel, and for Alexia? Um, well, so just to clarify, um, just some things, the mainstream media didn't cover anything. It was kind of all hushed over, and nothing was discussed about. It. it was all the other alternative media that were actually talking about what was going on. It's taken a while for the mainstream to actually kind of catch up with the narrative. Um, it must have been, so we were, because we are connected to other groups in New Zealand, straight away, um, this happened on a Tuesday. By Wednesday, we're hearing stories that weren't in line with government narrative. By Thursday, these stories were getting really out of hand and again, not in line with government narrative. By the time it got to the weekend, I was like, right, we, I need to get down there because there's so much, we don't know what's going on. 
Now, Kevin is on the call. I found Kevin because I know Kevin from another group and never, never met him before. And I was like, Kevin, can I come and stay? So me and another friend drove down from from Auckland, we gathered up supplies. We, we, we were on the phone to Kevin and some other groups saying, what is it that you need? What can't you get hold of? Um, and, and the amount of people, we would just talk about it in a PHA meeting on the Monday. I think we left on the Tuesday or Wednesday and we had a uh, cars full of, of product that had been donated and um, items that were needed. Now a big thing was colloidal silver for wounds and in the eyes because the the silt that had washed down was proven. Um, it, was, it, was, it was there was a lot of problems. If it gets into the eyes, people's eyes would become really irritated. Um, they were breathing it in. They were getting breathing problems. That people's legs when when they were going in to clean up, their the skin was peeling off the legs. So there was something in the silt that was causing this irritation. So we were we were quick to get colloidal silver to people in dropper bottles, um, in spray bottles. Um, and uh, remedies, um, just get shock remedies, trauma remedies out to people. Um, once we hit the ground, we realized that there was quite a few um, miscommunications with, with those people who were, who were shut off. They didn't realize they were just still in cleanup mode and no form of communicating with people. So we managed to speak to people who were cooking food but didn't know where to take it. Now, these people ended up driving around in vans and cars with, with with this food that chefs that had cooked and delivering it and just driving along to, and finding people and saying, hey, do you need food? Um, do you need help with cleanup? We can organize, uh, we know some cleanup teams, we can give them your address. So that would have been about eight days after the initial event that we started doing that. So through Kevin and Kevin's connections down in Hawke's Bay, we were able just to speak to people, drive to people, speak to them and find out exactly what was going on. And that's when you realize what's not being talked about by- A lot of it, it was compounded by the cell network um, went down. So all communications were down. There was no mobile coverage. Um, mm. There was no electricity. So it was really, um, um, yeah, a disaster situation unfortunately also uh looting started so mm. people had security risks um there was there was panic at super, the one supermarket that was open people were coming out with trolleys and it was promptly being stolen um so it was just um sort of a mad max scenario for for a few days and again no police response not not a, an adequate response um and people begging for the army to come and help and um yeah just just chaos really and and the media again not covering it um truthfully so yeah it's mm. just it was a very um galvanizing situation for for an organi organization like us and many others to immediately go and help people in need yeah and mm. it, it happened quite smoothly and and so you, Alexia and Rachel, are the coordinators of the um, the People's Health Alliance New Zealand. How many other people are working with you? I mean, was it just you two organising this whole thing? Or? Well, we have um, all the the hub leads, admins of the the groups around the country, and of course they have their networks. So it's quite a um, um, a network of people around the country, and of course New Zealand um not not that huge a country so we um we brought donations in from the south island to the north island top of the north to the Hawke's bay so it was really coming from everywhere and we've been helped by yes yeah, so many people in the hubs and mm. also outside of um the pha network but yeah um i think we have 1300 on our telegram page the main group around that number and um yeah, a lot of people stepped up and, and offered ideas, um, donations, um, mm. money donations too. So, um, yeah, it was all all um, sort of coming together quite nicely. It, it proved the need um, as, you know, people like Catherine McBean had foreseen that when the health systems and when main systems crash, we're going to need some kind of backup. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> and also... 
because it you know is a people led organization it means that those donations are going to go straight to the ground mm. right yeah yes so um people watching this this is a live interview so also the audience here as well um if they would like to get involved how can they help what could they do what are you looking for for the people's health alliance in new zealand <laughs> oh, so you, so you um we have a website that dash phnz if you go to the website um there's a section on hubs if you if you click onto that page it will take you through um to link straight through to telegram so most of our discussions are through telegram just because it's it's easier that way um and that's how pha England role so it means that we can tap into everything um, internationally through telegram you'll see the New Zealand telegram group on the hubs page and then you'll see all the other hubs that have set up and all of their pages so if you see a hub in your area join if you don't see one in your area when you introduce yourself to the main um, New Zealand telegram page you, we ask people to introduce themselves just so that we know where you are and what you do whether that's a member of the community who just wants to be part of this or whether you're a practitioner it means that anybody else who joins can search in the group to find either people in their area or if somebody joins and needs an acupuncturist near where they live they can search their area and acupuncturist and you will come up um, so it's really good to join those um, those channels um there's also oh there's there's so many the website's really great for videos if you want more information there's a lot of information on that website um, we've tried to make it as clear as possible and just put key interviews um, on the website um at the moment we are looking for um we're, we're kind of looking for places to to rent or even to just do pop-up hubs to get hubs starting to work together so if you know of anywhere that would be really good get in touch uh, with your local hub um if you yeah just if you want to be involved or you want to start one just see what's in your area to start with and if somebody would like to be involved you know do they need to be a practitioner are you also looking for people to help with the social media i mean because a lot of the reason I ask is because there's a lot of people out there who mm. who, you know, the, the, there's this feeling of like, I'm just me. I'm just kind of, you know, little me. What can I do? And the thing is that this is the perfect example yeah. of what, how we can all help. So, you know, what yeah. types of roles are you looking for? So if you think of the hubs and, and you need somebody who's really good at going through those chats in the Telegram to make sure that it's all, you know, working smoothly and to answer any questions. You need somebody who's good at um, looking at all of the other um, PHA groups for Zoom links or really interesting um, talks that are coming up to be able to post them in that channel. So we need people who are good at that because that helps the hub to run more efficiently. If your, if your group, your Telegram group page is, is running efficiently, then there seems to be more um, momentum um, within within the group, um, we need people to 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 market as well and to talk about it. So we 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 don't have any budget. I mean, myself and Alexia were not paid. There's no funding. We have to raise raise the money um, to print flyers and to get the website done and to maintain the website. So if you believe in this and and you think that this is a worthy cause to donate your time to, have some plat flyers printed and. Like go to um, events or like I go to a really lovely market near where I live. And I just know that most of the people there love or would love this concept. So I'll take some flies with me and I'll chat to people. And I'll say, oh, he's a flyer. And I'll put them up in the um, local organic shop um, and the community center. Um, that's important as well, because if you start talking and get more people on board, again, it builds, you're building momentum. Mm. That helps as well. And of course, practitioners and members of the public, because when we find a space, you know, ultimately that perfect space might have a garden as well, where you can, you know, you can start growing things as well as have your health hub, you know, and community spaces. It's not just health hubs. 
Yeah, because it's also the People's uh, Food and Farming Alliance. So connecting people directly. So that's an, an, another that, that Catherine McBean and others have founded as well, is you've got people connecting people directly to the farmers, um, connecting mm -hmm. people directly in a community to grow food. So it's really, this is what I find so inspiring about it, is it's like bringing it down to the people and getting the people to start organizing together to create yes. the solutions that we need for health and food, which are, of course, you know, two of the big ones moving mm -hmm. forward. Um, and also, perhaps we can mention now that, you know, the People's Health Alliance is not just in New Zealand and not just in England. It's actually going global and that mm -hmm. there's there, there's hubs appearing all over the world. Um, I think it's in 30 countries around the world now, 32. Um, so, yeah, it really has um, caught the hearts of um, the communities all around the world yeah yeah i think now is the time people know it so, yeah we're really, um keen to get um food and farming off the ground too and link it in with the hubs because of course it's um an absolute base at aspect of health um the food we eat um and it's very important to get the farmers the growers connected direct to the people too we we're all sick of bureaucracy and um middle people so we're we're going straight to the, the people mm. and hawks bear was a really large growing area so there's a lot a lot of um vineyards uh fruit trees orchards uh, there's a lot being wiped out it's, it's huge one of the biggest areas for growing in new zealand so we really need to be mindful of supporting our farmers and building up that connection so we can we can guarantee we can guarantee food and we we know it's not going to be sold overseas fantastic so that's that's how people can get involved with the with the the pha new zealand um i i avoid saying nz because you've got nz and nz <laughs> but uh <laughs> the people's health alliance new zealand uh what about my last question what about people who are you know we've talked a little bit about trauma what about people that are struggling, people that are having that, that are, are feeling the challenge of these, uh, you know, unprecedented times that we're all kind of going through right now? Um, maybe Alexia first, what would be your advice um, to people that are struggling in these times? Um, I, th I think um, the connection, connection is key. And that's why another reason these hubs are so important is it can be as simple as, um, you know, meeting with like-minded others in a, in a cafe or at the beach um, connection helps us all it you know grows our heart space um, and that will raise our spirits and um, we're so grateful for the organization you've built over these last two three years um, to to make a positive um, to, to emphasize and um, accentuate the positive because that is what can lift us out and give us hope but yeah, I would say um, the, the crux of these hubs is, is connection and community, which will will see us right, the people together. And I would just add as well, not just uh, like what I'm doing is it's not just the positive. It's uh, I see the system as, you know, it's an abusive system. It's not it doesn't care about us if you take the system. And what, the way I see it is, you know, what do you do if you're in an, in an abusive relationship? You can't persuade that abuser to be nice to you you can't change that you know you can't uh, ask the abuser to be nice or get their behavior to change the only solution is to walk away from that abuser and create a better reality for yourself so it's about moving more and more and more into where we want to go which is why I love you know what the PHA are doing Rachel what would your advice be for people that are struggling in these times um, well, I'll second what um, Alexia has said, because the, that was the biggest thing about being on the ground in Hawke's Bay, the amount of people that you were just, you know, you're just asking them, are you OK? And then, you know, they would just be so upset, but then they would be so grateful. They'd be hugging you and they just they couldn't believe how amazing people were. So they've gone through this, you know, traumatic and still going through. Yet it's those people that are turning up and offering help and support and helping that is it, it's it's the light that's that's shining that's just getting them through. Um, I think another thing is to just look out on the on the the PHA websites because uh, sorry on the through the Telegram channels there's so many amazing 
meditations, um, discussions, uh, specialist people talking. There's so much happening that it really is. Um, it's great at shifting that mindset and helping you to think, okay, what is it that I want to create? Um, and, and all the tools and the tips and the groups are there. You know, you can tap into almost anything um, and, and just connect, connect with those people and build what you want. What is it that you want? Just, just start, start small, like, like we've done with, with virtual hubs where it's just discussions in groups and community ask questions. And then, you know, they'll advise, you know, various um, solutions or social events. We've been having social events and that's been amazing because that's what is lifting people through it and helping them to, to think, okay, there is a way out and I can be part of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel, that... sorry, Alexia, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the, the division that was created um, and purposefully created over the last few years has cut the deepest um and yeah been so hurtful and and um caused so much um despair that these this idea and this vision has is is just something like a lifeboat that people can grasp onto now because we we know that we can like you say just turn away from from that <laughs> the um mm -hmm. the uh, the illusion of um I've lost my words now, but we can turn away from what they're trying to put upon us and and create the new uh, vision that we we remember from um, our our childhood, our um, how it used to be. We can revillage and um, again create what we what we want for our families and for the yeah our future children. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah, I was also just going to say, because I did an interview yesterday and, I, and and what was coming up in that interview is that, you know, it's that, that you know, I, I've said this all along, you know, we are the ones that we're waiting for, you yeah. know, and and now is the time. So my question to that person was, you know, do you feel that there's just, you know, certain people out there that are being called to kind of stand in the light and come forward and take action? Or do you feel that it's now the time for all of us to come forward and take action? And um, her answer was, it's time for all of us to come forward and take action. Um, uh, and I imagine that would be the same response from Rachel and Alexia that, you know, this is a perfect example of how we can just, you know, find our way to contribute to start creating the world that we would like to live in instead of, um, you know, you've got the, the people that are, are maybe completely unaware of what's going on and uh, things are going to have to get worse before they get up out of the sofa and, and realise, oh, I don't like this anymore. But equally, mm -hmm. once you realise what's going on, uh, we can also just be uh, media absorbers, content absorbers, or we can say, no, now I'm ready to take action myself and just find my way to contribute. So I think that's what's wonderful, truly wonderful about what you're doing. Um, is there anything else, Rachel or Alexia, you'd like to share to finish? You've already shared the website for the PHA. Are there any other uh, websites that you would like to, or links that you'd like to share with people or any last words? I think I'd just like to um, add to what you just said. Um, I think, if you can make a difference, you just start, don't worry about whether you know 20 people who are awake and 50 people who are asleep. I think if you start creating, that has a ripple effect. And it's not about trying to wake everyone up before you get started. Just start or just join a hub that's already gone and just create because people will see what you're doing and see what's happening. Um, and, and yeah, that's all I want to say. Yeah, and also trying to wake people up doesn't work anyway. If you throw yeah. a whole load of information yeah. at people... No <laughs> they're just I gonna we've all, we've all tried that and tried and failed <laughs> i think that's part of the process you first of all you're like oh no all this is going on <laughs> check this out and then you realize that doesn't work and then the next step is okay so what can i actually constructively do yeah hmm. so we we turn to just quietly getting on with what what we want and um just finding that everyone has a voice that they can express they can contribute in, um, in whatever small way, basically just standing up and joining in 
is um mm. is what is needed to um for everyone for people to unite and and show what we want not what um a small number of um yeah <laughs> overlords are trying to impose on us <laughs> And also, yeah, being the example, that's how I see, you know, Gandhi talked about, uh, you know, being the change. I think it's a lot less uh, dramatic if you just say, be an example, you know, be an example of, of the world you would like to live in. Mm. Um, thank you so much, Alexia and Rachel. I'm going to open it up for questions. But first of all, Rachel, you said that you actually on the ground dealing with this cyclone situation, uh, you actually met Kevin. Uh, so if it's okay, I'd just like to uh, unmute or ask Kevin to unmute first. And if you wouldn't mind, Kevin, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit of what this experience has been like for you. Be kind. <laughs> oh, um, a bit of my history, I've been in New Zealand 20 years uh, from Zimbabwe. So coming from Zimbabwe, um, a war situation, enough said. Um, I um, have been a member of the Red Cross Urban Search and Rescue team for uh, the Christchurch earthquake. Uh, when that stopped, I joined uh, civil defense here in Hastings. Um, that's the sort of the, a, a bit of the history. Um, when this happened, we were, we were called up. I am part of the communications section as a volunteer. We were called up and we did shifts there. And I soon realized that people did not recognize it as a war situation. And it damn well was. Um, and after a week, we were instructed that we had to have daily rat tests and um, wear masks, and that's against my principles. So I said, sorry, I'm a volunteer, I'm out of here. I then looked at the area that was affected, and basically there's four main rivers that um, uh, channeled this water down. Um, and I had a look, and there was reasonable government response in a couple of them, but in particular, the Esk River Valley that was most badly hit, I think the thing that, that turned me is that there are some army reserve, which they call territorials here. And in that area, they were all on training in a different part of the country, except for two guys. Those two guys got their big four-wheel drive Unimog, and they were told that they had to stand down. They put their finger in the air and they went out and they rescued heaps of people. And mm. that's where I realized that um, we had to step forward and do stuff. So I basically adopted Esk Valley and um, I don't know if, um, no, I can't share a screen with my, um, the van. I use a van and I just channel stuff. Um, up and down um, to S Valley two, three times a week. I collect stuff from Voices for Freedom, uh, food from Nourish for No, and, um, and take the colloidal silver and various flower essences um, up to, um, to S Valley, to a place, to a restaurant that was quite elevated, so it didn't have too much, uh, too much damage. Um, uh, what can I say? Yeah, as I put in the text, it, the best description is a reverse tsunami. Mm. It was just a mountain of water. But, you know, from what I see from tsunamis, a tsunami, um, there's a big wave that comes in and then it goes out. This big wave came in and kept on coming with that cyclone that, you know, um, how can you have six, seven, eight meters of water? Mm. You know, this is a thousand year flood or it's a little bit um, a little bit more than we actually see. And this is where, you know, I've had a, a gentleman coming and staying with my, me and my in the caravan and he spent a week trying to find out the truth. And, you know, as as Rachel and Alexa have said, there's so many different stories that it's, it, it's, it's, it's quite frustrating. Anyway, I, I need to get off my soapbox, otherwise I'll keep you here for another hour. But um, welcome to answer sort of any, any questions. Um, 
that you've had. Um, when I went to Valley Divine, see, I'm not getting off my soapbox like yeah, I said no. I was. <laughs> um, when I went to Valley Divine, the definite, I had to be, I was so stressed out myself, not being affected at all, but having to be so sensitive and empathic mm -hmm. because people were coming in there that were either wanting to fight me, wanting to run away from me, or were just frozen in shock, that flight, fight, freeze um, syndrome. And to be able to, you know, it was really stressful to sort of, no, I can't approach that person. Yes, I can approach this person. Um, uh, no, it's much better. A woman, ah, just that whole, whole really tense atmosphere. Um, but that's sort of once they got to know me and, and you know, as part of the furniture there, uh, that was really good. Mm. Okay, I yield. That just actually brings me to this. I mean, I'm very much into, you know, like following intuition and what you describe in there, Kevin, I can imagine when you've got that whole fight, flight, freeze thing going on and all the different reactions, you've got to follow, you know, I say intuition, Other, someone else might say your gut, but you've got to go with that in that type of response. You know, it's kind of your subconscious needs to take over at that point. Um, mm. Was that how it kind of felt for you, Kevin, in that situation? Oh, de definitely, you know, um, yeah, you know, back in my youth, I was, I had to make decisions um, in, in connection with the, the sort of war situation there, and the, the buck stopped with me, um, and I just found that it was, it was very difficult here that, you know, why weren't the army called in? Why weren't the army said, there's your area, save as many people, save some animals what do you need and just let the army go in there um mm. but no um the system in new zealand uh, 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 is an international type of system that hinges around a coordinated incident management system which is what a lot of civil defense um uh, uh um systems uh, uh systems do um so um yes very uh, very stressful um, quite a few practitioners have got to the stage of how do you counsel the counsellor? Mm. Yeah, and I think that's where the hubs come in because we were seeing when the, 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 as soon as they started to pop up, you, you're seeing the people who are supporting the people directly affected because the people directly affected are still running on adrenaline. But you still need to support the people supporting those affected because then that's one layer that's taken care of and there can be the support to those people more effectively. And then they're also ready to catch those people and bring them in for help when they need it. Um, and I think that's the other thing. People are just, um, you know, you get there and you, you're meeting all these people. And the first thing that would say, you know, they've lost everything. They've, you know, they've seen, they've lost everything. They've, they've found bodies. They've seen all kinds of craziness. Um, and the sheer force of the water, just so that you understand how frightening it was, some houses were literally lifted and moved um, off their foundations. The railway lines are completely twisted and bent, and some of it's just washed away. It was that powerful. Um, and you say to them, are you OK? And the first thing that most of them would say was, I don't understand. What, I, why, why aren't the government talking about it? Why is there nobody here? Why haven't they sent anybody in? It was a psychological trauma, and that... That is the hardest thing, like when you're there, because you can help clear up or you can help um, distribute food or ask them what is it that you need and organize somebody else to come along the next day with what they need or at least start a chain of events. But those kind of questions when you're just like, we don't know, we don't understand, we don't we don't know either. And when, um, you, when you feel like you're not being heard as well, right? Yeah. It's uh, why is the government not talking about this? Mm. Why is nobody? And as far as I know, there's not really been much about this on the news in other parts of the world either. Like, I don't think that it's been on the on the news in the UK, for example. Um, mm. I'm not in the UK right now, so I'd have to check. I'll phone my mum after this interview and find out no, if she's heard I about don't, this. I don't think there was. It's kind of no. that lockstep media um, organisation that's that's now, um, you know, mainstream media. It's, they pick up 
they don't um you know follow locally what's happening they just have one kind of narrative so mm. yeah not much went out internationally either I, I just want to say thank you um you know for everything that you're doing um it's it's amazing in so many ways and to actually go there you know to these war-torn areas and offer the help that you've been offering. And it is the psychological help that is the most important. And it is, you know, the fact that there's just been this abandonment mm. uh, is just extraordinary and unfathomable, unfathomable. And I don't think anybody can understand what it's like to experience a situation until you've actually experienced it. I haven't mm. been in that sort of situation and I and I don't know what it's like and you know but the the terror uh and the trauma is massive and I feel like it's on a par with the Christchurch earthquakes mm. and it's just extraordinary that you know I I don't watch the news I you know it's a conscious thing that I don't I don't watch the mainstream news so I'm not you know, keeping up to date um, <clears throat> with what is on a new, the news, but it, it is apparent from what I've heard that they haven't really covered it much apart from the initial drama, because of course the news is always about drama and fear mongering. So I think what you're doing is, I mean, overall what you're doing is amazing, but, you know, actually going to these areas and, and offering tangible help is fantastic. And, uh, you should all be knighted or whatever the word, you know, <laughs> not that we really want to get into that, do we? But you know what I mean. <laughs> no, we, was, we were just so happy, so happy we had a framework to um to be able to support. And and the teams, like you're saying, the teams that were actually the other groups of people, um, and they were often from the freedom crowd who um, went there. One, one woman in particular, Zeb Jackson, has just mm -hmm. been a phenomenal force. She's um, the people's champion. She's got in and dug out houses because they're, they're, the houses are filled with silt. Um, people's properties are just completely covered. Their cars, their animals, everything is buried. So um, they, she organized pretty much single-handedly diggers, um, heavy machinery, and just people on spades. Um, so we we were lucky to be able to support um, groups like that who were physically doing the um, you know, the hard work, actually digging homes and um, livelihoods out of the the mud. Um, yeah, we there were vitamin companies that donated um, supplements, so that was really important for them to be able to keep up an immunity. And like you say, the silt is toxic; it's full of mm -hmm. you know sewage sprays from the agricultural areas. Um, so yeah, we were just happy to be able to, okay, we can directly take a, a bunch of vitamins to um, this group or some, we even made our own um, remedy because listening to alternative media, um, people were describing having an anxiety over the rain, the sound of rain on the roof. So it, it carried on raining um, uh, during those post two weeks. Not, not heavily, but any rain on the roof would make a kind of an anxiety. So we, we made an essential oil. Um, one beautiful volunteer made up a um, rain anxiety remedy. So we made, um, and also now she has a Phoenix Rising remedy, which we're happy to, to be still giving out to, um, to groups down there now. It's, uh, it's ongoing seven weeks later. And we were lucky that um, in the sense that there was, we were due to, there was, there was like a, not a festival, but there was a big meeting planned in Dannyvirk of um, lots of freedom communities um, coming together to discuss, okay, how do we see uh, building back New Zealand? How do we build these communities? Um, and how do we, you know, stop what's happening? And that was due to happen, I think the week after. So it was amazing that you know, many people had had like five days to a week uh, where they were planning on going down. So it, it was a no brainer. People just got together and went in. Um, and because of those networks and those groups that we've joined, where many of these other groups and freedom fighters are in, that's when Alexia and myself can connect quite easily and quickly and understand what's happening. Um, and then through the PHA network, people 
saying, okay, I can turn up and donate my time. I do contact care for animals and people. You know, it was like, okay, go and see these people. We were able to connect people really quickly. And that was the beauty of it was, it was people power. Um, Just people donating their time to clean up or, you know, to go and see people who just needed help. Um, It was, yeah, it was beautiful. It actually highlighted how how far we've come in building the new. Um, we, you know, over these last three years, but there's been a lot of groups beavering away, and and suddenly it it was there the the parallel uh, reality and the parallel systems that we um, we want are there, and so yeah, we it showed how how far we've come. Mm. I can make Kevin a co-host for a moment. Uh-oh. The privilege, <laughs> Kevin. All right, I guess this will be kind of to wrap it up, so you can now share your screen. <laughs> That's a colloidal silver bottle in factory that we did every morning um, <laughs> and night time while we were fielding calls and planning for the day for the next day. <laughs> also, note the t-shirts. Yeah, PHA t-shirts. <laughs> and this is what people need to see you know it's so inspiring to see ordinary you know I say ordinary you're obviously you know wonderful exceptional people but you know non-famous ordinary people doing amazing things to help <laughs> yes. and that's right. the van that uh, um, I used to trip up the S Valley and you know do a little bit of promotion for PHA and the other groups <laughs> <laughs> professionally sign written there yeah it's that, it's that sign writing stuff that you paint just married on cars that that house was not built there that house floated there from about uh, 100 meters away um that car has still got a piece of wood sticking on top and i didn't put that wood there for the photo either um it's quite hard to see in that photo but the um that hedge line on on the other side you can see the flood waters against that hedge line were up to all the roof of that house mm. oh and we've got john says i need to go now thank you so much for your talk rachel alexia and kevin i need to actually click on the chat Wow, that's amazing. Taking this opportunity to thank you for everything on CPN, Robito, and the other people. Yeah. Wow. Thank you yeah, so we're, much. We're, we're so grateful. Thank you, Robito. We're very grateful for um, you talking to us tonight, your morning. <laughs> um, it's just um, amazing to be able to share and, and like you say, to be heard is, um, is very mm. um, healing for us, for us all here. So thank you. Yeah. Not and not only that, I mean I'll send you a message after this is after we've finished, but the whole idea now of you know it was COVID positive news. I was reporting on everything from a positive perspective. We've now called it the Conscious People's Network. And it's it's really just about, you know, people that uh, are are kind of shining standing in the light that are doing amazing things, okay. but those people that are really now kind of doing something. I really want to see if we can just get those people networking with each other. They can, you know, do podcast interviews with each other and however it is that they can just help each other to get the word out. So that's my my new idea or vision for CPN. And uh, after this, we will, I'll share with you like how you can share stuff into the channel and how you can contact and network with other people. Catherine McBean is totally behind it as well. So mm-hmm. um so thank you. Thank you for contacting me. It's been a, a, a wonderful, inspiring interview, I think, for, so, for, for, for many, many people that are going to watch this now. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.